I would like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Five Key Traits of Effective Disaster Recovery on Kubernetes. I'm Suraj Narode, Platform Engineer at USWIT and Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Michael Ferranti, VP of Product Marketing at Fortworks. So a uh, few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of CNCF and such is subject to CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. So with that, I'll hand it over to Michael to kick off today's presentation. Great. Thank you, Siraj. Uh, thank you for um, that introduction and thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited um, to present today. This is one of my favorite topics um, and you probably think I say that about all my topics, but, um, but I, I really do think that, you know, disaster recovery for Kubernetes is both interesting and in its own right, but also the fact that we're talking about it and we have so many people interested in this topic is really um, a huge statement of maturity of the overall Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, you know, disaster recovery is not the first problem uh, a company needs to solve in their cloud native journey, uh, but it is an essential problem to solve before cloud native technologies and, and practices within an organization really become ubiquitous. So the fact that we're talking about this here means that a lot of people are either at that part of their journey or they know that they're gonna need to get there eventually um, and they're looking for uh, to, to understand the problem and to start thinking about solutions. This, this webinar today is not about any particular solution to disaster recovery. Uh, there are many on the market and you know, I'll, I'll share at the very end of the webinar a little bit about uh, what Fortworks does in that space. But today's webinar is really about understanding what are the contours um, or what are the requirements for effective disaster recovery for Kubernetes applications. And, and that's very distinct from um, uh, DR for traditional applications or applications that run in VMs, even if those happen to be in kind of modern environments like the cloud. So, so really excited to, to talk about all that today. Um, a little bit of background on me, I'll go through this really, really quickly. Um, you know, I, I've been, and I'm realizing I'm wearing the same sweater as in my headshot. Um, I, people have told me before that like I'm, I'm the, uh, you know, I, I look exactly like my headshot. Um, and I guess in that case, that that is true. I gotta you know, make sure to change my sweater. Um, you know, I've been doing, uh, this is my second company working around data management and persistent storage for containers. Um, and, um, you know, my first company started actually before Kubernetes was, was released from Google um, uh, back when it was still called Borg. So I've been thinking about these problems for a long time. Um, and I've been working with a lot of companies over a number of years as they've implemented those solutions. And so a lot of what I'll talk about today is based on those, you know, concrete learnings from working with real, real customers. Um, and happy to share that with you and some of those lessons learned. Um, you know, I'll start with kind of um, a, uh, a little bit of a meta commentary on how we got here. Um, because, you know, Kubernetes is a key part of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, and it will continue to be for years to come. But I think some of the trends that we're seeing are really bigger than Kubernetes. And, and Kubernetes uh, was released uh, by Google. Um, and, and prior to that, kind of its, its early uh, uh, forebearer was created by Google because there was this shift happening. And, um, you know, as the old uh, saying goes, the future is already here. It's just not widely distributed yet. Um, what companies like Google and others started to see is that the traditional way of managing an enterprise data center was not up to the task of running truly large scale, highly dense multi-tenant applications like you had with you know, Google search or YouTube or you know, you, other, other um, uh, large SaaS applications that were doing similar things um, to, uh, to Google in the early days. Um, and and that, that, that traditional way of running an enterprise data center was really organized around the virtual machine. Um, and, and we call this a machine-defined control plane. 
meaning the thing that is most important in our architecture, in our data center, um, is the virtual machine. And that could be, you know, within VMware, you know, great name for a company if you think the VM is, is the most important part, right, VMware. Uh, but even in the cloud, um, Amazon, Google, um, uh, Azure, the, that, that prime object is also the virtual machine, right? The cloud is, is just the data center that's been virtualized and provided as a service. Um, and in making the, the VM the center of our architectures, what we did is we figured out ways to, um, to manage those individual VMs. We would, we would back the VM up, we would migrate the VM, we would um, you know, provide data security by encrypting the VM. Um, and then eventually we would run applications on top of those VMs. But then if we wanted to back up the application, well, we would just back up the VM because there was this assumption that most applications uh, ran on a single server. Now, fast forward to today, and we're realizing, um, or, or maybe now it, it is just the case that um, most applications do not run in a single VM, right? We, we have distributed applications. We have distributed databases like Cassandra and Kafka um, Elasticsearch that in most instances run across several machines. And so the idea that we can control our application through some subset of machine-based operations no longer is the case. Um, the second kind of change and the, and the reason that we need what we call an application-defined control plane um, is because not only do typical applications run across multiple hosts so that, you know, individual machine-based operations are no longer sufficient, but there's also this problem of how do you make sure that the infrastructure is available when the application needs it? Um, and this is maybe a little bit um, of a longer term discussion. I would love to come back and talk about this topic in, in more detail in another webinar, but we're starting to see Kubernetes not only, you know, provide mechanisms for managing applications directly, as opposed to managing them kind of as um, a collection of machine objects, uh, but also to provision infrastructure when it's needed uh, based on the application requirements. Um, so I would, I would, I would bring up um, uh, projects like Kubert um, through its plugin model. Um, you know, companies like Portworks are doing this from a storage perspective, basically allowing a, a, a containerized application to provision its own infrastructure on demand. Um, and I think that's also a really, really important part of this of this new model. And it's much, much different from the, the old world where we would provision some infrastructure, then we would run some applications on it. Then when we needed more infrastructure, we would provision the app, the, the infrastructure, and then run more apps on top of it. Kubernetes is, is, is merging that world of application deployment and infrastructure deployment into, um, uh, into a single set of processes um, that are controlled at the application level. Um, okay, so, so what does this have to do with DR? Well, a lot, uh, because the core argument that I'm going to make is that DR itself needs to be, um, uh, needs to be controlled as an application construct, not as an infrastructure concept, um, as it has in the past, right? And if we start to zoom in now, if we said, okay, so we're in this app controlled world, what does that look like? Um, well, we have this new stack. Right, it's based around Kubernetes, but it's a um, it's a pluggable model where I can plug in different solutions for monitoring based on standard interfaces. The same for security, the same for networking, the same for storage. Um, and in doing so, as an or as an IT organization overall, um, I get a lot of benefits. Excuse me, I get a lot of benefits from that. Right, the, you know, we, we hear this from almost every customer that we talk to. I mean, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a selection bias thing. You know, companies that adopt Kubernetes want to do more of it. Um, but what we hear them say is, you know, we're more efficient when we run applications on Kubernetes. Our developers are happy. We leverage automation more and though ha have less problems, less security breaches. Um, and, and, and that's a great thing, right? Uh, of course, that is a great thing. That's what we're all going for. That, that's the reason that, you know, a conference like KubeCon is, you know, getting 10,000 attendees. Um, it's because this stuff really matters in the real world of enterprise IT. Now, bringing it back to DR, what we're also noticing is that there's kind of a, um, uh, uh, there's a point at which organizations bump up to, into limits of how many more applications they can put onto the Kubernetes platform without having Kubernetes native ways of solving some key business requirements. So if I go to the next slide, I would say that, you know, 
an organization's ability to benefit from cloud native technologies and Kubernetes is going to be limited by how many apps they can get to effectively run on that platform. And I would argue that the, the primary barrier to running apps on Kubernetes is not what I'll call a technical barrier, right? The, the inability to run this particular process in a container, right? It's not, or, or to be able to describe it um, in a Kubernetes deployment file, right? That's not the problem. The problem rather is addressing key business requirements um, that would prevent an application from running in this environment or, or, or that environment. And there I mean things like um, maybe data protection, right? Can, can I be confident that this app running in Kubernetes has the same level of data protection as I'm able to provide, um, say, in a VMware environment on-prem because I have a bunch of different tooling in, in that environment? Or, you know, can it provide the same level of a, a disaster recovery, maybe in terms of zero RPO or, you know, the ability to guarantee zero data loss in, in the event of an entire uh, a data center outage. It's these types of business requirements that can prevent those incremental apps from moving over to Kubernetes. And thus, if we want to in get more out of our Kubernetes investment, what one of the things that we can do, one of the most effective things that we can do is start to figure out how do we address these underlying business requirements so that if we go to any um, user within our organization, and here I'm kind of talking from um, an IT perspective, but we could also say, you know, if I'm, you know, I'm into it and I have, you know, hundreds of teams building different components of a SaaS application, I could also say, how do I go to any team and, and give them confidence that they can run their application more efficiently, more securely, more performant on Kubernetes than in their traditional environment, right? When I can do that, then Kubernetes really can be the overall control plane for our entire data center. And all of the benefits that we talked about in the previous slide, you know, start, start to accrue at a macro level within the organization, not only for a small subset of our applications, right? So that, that's where we want to get to. Um, you know, what, what we've noticed working with our customers, because the, the problem of bringing that incremental app to Kubernetes tends to be a business requirement problem, not a kind of what a quote unquote technical problem, um, what, what we've seen work really well is the implementation of a Kubernetes storage platform. Because if you look at what the, um, those types of barriers, data security, disaster recovery, backup and recovery, compliance, governance, migration, at the core, all of those business requirements have this concept of there's some data that I need to be able to manage in a particular way. Um, and if I can do that in a Kubernetes native way, then those business requirements are solved and I can bring all of those apps over. Um, you know, if I were to kind of boil it down and say, well, why do I need a Kubernetes storage platform? Again, I'm not proposing any particular platform, um, but rather arguing that the concept applies to, the, to uh, the problem at hand of bringing apps over to Kubernetes. I would say that all enterprise apps have data, right? You have to be able to manage data in order to run enterprise applications. We can we can do microservices all day long and there can be stateless microservices, but there are not stateless applications, right? So, so data is ubiquitous within the enterprise. Um, just as, you know, Kubernetes is new software, new technology in order to solve new problems of scale, of uh, running distributed applications, of running multi-tenant applications. And we had to build this software to solve these new problems. Um, we would argue that your existing storage technologies that were built and optimized over you know, a, a, a decade or more to solve the problems posed by VMs are not a good fit to solve the problems posed by, by containers. And it's simply the scale and the dynamism of a Kubernetes environment is just an order of magnitude greater than a typical VM environment. And, and, and you know, the best technology is, is technology that's purpose built for requirements um, and, and those requirements often are not met by kind of existing uh, technology that, that wasn't built for Kubernetes. Um, and finally, you know, there's always a desire amongst uh, engineers to, you know, to subdivide a problem, you know, not boil the ocean, you know, pick low hanging fruit and get some early wins there. And, and you know, I agree with all of that. But sometimes it, with, within Kubernetes, we can say, well, let's take our stateless applications and run them outside of the platform. Let's move our stateful applications, run them on the platform, and that's going to simplify things. Uh, but in fact, what we found working with a number of customers is that having those dual systems actually complicates things. Uh, it increases the complexity of the system 
Um, uh, it increases the cost because you're running two different systems. Um, uh, oftentimes cloud lock-in if you're using managed services. Um, and at the end of the day, that increased complexity reduces agility. And so, and so we don't want that. Um, now, again, we're talking about DR today. And so I'm gonna, you know, the next slide after this is gonna talk all about DR and the effective traits of DR. But I, I really wanna make sure this last point is clear before I move on to the specifics. Um, remember, our goal is to allow Kubernetes to be the data center control plane, right? We, we want, um, you know, as, as practitioners of Kubernetes, who, who see that there is a better way to build and run applications. Uh, we want to be able to run as many applications on Kubernetes as, as possible because it's simply a better way, right? It's more efficient, it's more cost effective, developers like their jobs better, et cetera. Um, solving DR is critical to that, right? And we're gonna talk a lot about that, but you also have to think about how do I do migrations across clouds? How do I do backup? How do I do data security? How do I do govern governance? And, and because all of these problems have data at their core, they're, they're distinct, but they're also similar. And so I would, I would encourage you as you're thinking about, you know, what is my DR strategy for Kubernetes? How can that DR strategy also help you, you know, with, with migrations, right? If you're doing an on-prem to cloud migration um, or, you know, cloud, cloud to cloud, how can this ability to, to manipulate data, um, to move objects between environments, how can I use that to also solve my migration problems or also solve my backup problems? Um, what you'll find is you have fewer tools um, uh, to manage, fewer tools to learn, and you can get greater um, efficiency from the processes that you're putting in place. Um, but let's let's now talk focus for the rest of the webinar just on DR, because I think you know we could easily spend you know you know several hours on this topic. Um, you, you, just to a kind of establish why we're here, right? You know, DR is clearly important to all enterprise applications. Um, and, you know, I, I say all, um, and I don't mean that, you know, the DR requirements for, you know, our, our core transaction processing system on Cyber Monday are the same as for our CI CD environment or our Jenkins environment. But some, but uh, 451 um, analyst firm did some research and they, they looked at, you know, applications that would be considered non critical, business critical, and mission critical. And then what were the associated um, re recovery time objective and recovery um, point objective for these um, uh, for these applications and, and those are metrics you know basically how long um, uh, how much downtime can we suffer right before an application is back up and running right before you know our users can reconnect to that application that's RTO um, and how much data are we willing to lose right we could we could have a very um, uh, we could have a long RTO say, you know, app needs to be up and running within 24 hours, right? We're okay having down, having downtime for up to 24 hours, but we can't lose any data, right? That would be, that would be a one day RTO and a, and a, and a zero RPO, right? These are just the co common um, uh, DR um, kind of levers that, that we can pull. Well, it turns out that, you know, for mission critical apps, the RTO objectives and the RPO objectives of less than an hour are 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 pretty um, are pretty ubiquitous. Or I should to rephrase that, most organizations have very aggressive RTO and RPOs for mission critical applications, and you know that's not surprising. But if you look at this chart, you know even our non critical applications have non zero um, uh, RTOs. Um, and in some cases, low RPOs. In other words, how much data can we afford to lose? And I would, um, I would frame this in terms of something like a Jenkins server, right? Um, you know, unless you're cloud bees, most, most likely the way that your business makes money, it's not through your, you know, your CI CD pipeline in the sense that that's not your product, that's not what you're selling. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're an e-commerce website or you sell, you know, AI software, or whatever, you know, you know, sports forecasting, whatever the case may be. Um, but your Jenkins environment is a critical dev tool. And if your dev pipeline shuts down, then you can't make updates to the thing that you do sell, which then in turn could lose money. So even these non-production or non-mission critical applications also require disaster recovery. And that's really the point which is that within Kubernetes, what we need to be able to do is provide DR at the application granular level and be able to choose different RTOs and RPOs based on the types of applications. Any app running on Kubernetes should be able, we should be able to apply DR to any app running on Kubernetes, but we should be able to um, pick and choose 
our RTO and our RPO based on business requirements, network topology, and other requirements such that we can fit into, the, into this model where we have different RPOs and RTOs for different applications. Okay, so the webinar is called Five Traits of Effective Disaster Recovery on Kubernetes. Um, and so I wanna walk through five things. Um, you know, the reason why we have to have this webinar is simply because DR for containers is different from DR for VMs. I'm not suggesting that you forget everything that you know about, uh, um, about disaster recovery, okay, and, and learn it all fresh with Kubernetes. Um, in fact, I've just talked about kind of the core concepts of, of DR, RPO, and RTO. Those still apply in a Kubernetes environment. But how we ensure those RTOs and RPOs is, is different based on the ways in which um, uh, Kubernetes and containers are different from VMs. And so I'm gonna walk through each of these uh, in turn. Um, so you can really understand that. And again, you know, th th I would say, you know, if, if um, you know, Portworx didn't exist and I didn't work at Portworx, I would still give the same talk, meaning these are concepts that apply regardless of which solution you pick in order to meet the, uh, in order to meet the requirements. Uh, so the first concept um, is container granularity. And this is like, you know, I win the prize for most obvious statement that, you know, DR for containers needs to be container granular. But, but the reason why this is, I think is really, really important. And it goes back to that difference between the ma machine-based world and the application-based world. So we can illustrate this in a, in, a, in a really simple example, which is to say, you know, we have a three node Kubernetes cluster and we're running a bunch of apps on that, on that cluster. Um, we have a one three node Cassandra database or a Cassandra ring, and we have three one node MySQL databases. And so the simple question we can ask to understand how container granularity applies to um, uh, DR for Kubernetes is to ask the question, how do you back up just one of these applications? Um, and you, you'll see that it starts to be complex if the only tool in our arsenal is a machine-based backup. So, you know, let's say I wanna back up one of my MySQL databases. These are individual MySQL databases. They each run wholly on a single server, right? Distinct from our Cassandra, which is a distributed database across three servers. With MySQL, it's easy. It runs on a single server. Let me just take a, a backup of, of node one, and now I've got a backup of my MySQL database. Well, that's not the case because node one also includes, um, you know, Cassandra configuration um, and Cassandra data. So when I restore that backup, I'm gonna have to get rid of all of that stuff in order to um, just restore my MySQL. Um, what I want to be able to do is, is, is capture only the state associated with that single MySQL database running on node one and, and leave behind all of my Cassandra, right? That's what we call container granularity. Um, by the same token, if I want to back up my, my distributed Cassandra database, um, clearly I can't just take a snapshot or a backup of a single node. I need to do it for all three. But then I run into the inverse problem which is that now I have all a bunch of MySQL data, right? I have three individual MySQL volumes that I don't need for the purpose of backing up my Cassandra, right? And let's say those MySQLs are, you know, a, a terabyte each. Do I really want to back up all of that data when the, when the question at hand is backing up Cassandra? Clearly I don't. What I want to be able to do is zoom in on the container granular volumes and provide a backup of only those volumes. Um, so the next point is, is Kubernetes namespace awareness. And this is simply the idea that DR that's custom built for Kubernetes speaks the language of Kubernetes. So, you know, increasingly uh, teams are running, you know, dozens or hundreds of pods in a single Kubernetes namespace. Um, and I want to, you know, back up not just my MySQL database or not just my Cassandra database, in, in the previous example, in a container granular fashion. But I also want to back up an entire namespace, right? I'm, I might have a, a business unit within my organization that I've given a Kubernetes namespace, and I want to make sure that the entire thing is backed up, right? Not just an individual application, but all of the applications running in the namespace. And I want to be able to do that with a single command, Kubernetes command, not as a combination of these machine granular commands that we've already seen are problematic. Um, 
this is what that would look like, right? And it, it's, it's actually even more complex than this diagram makes it look because it kind of looks like namespace one is running on, the, on these servers on the left and namespace two is running on these servers on the right. But in fact, what's happening is Kubernetes is multiplexing all of these containers, which in and of themselves are distributed systems, in and of themselves are composed of multiple pods running across any combination. It makes it impossible to think about a single machine-based command that would capture this concept of a Kubernetes namespace. The problem with the kind of what I'll call legacy or existing DR solutions, um, oops, sorry, got overzealous with the, um, uh, the, um, the mouse pad. Um, hopefully everybody can see my slide again. Um, the problem with kind of traditional um, or existing DR solutions is that they don't have these concepts of the Kubernetes API in place. So if I want to back up namespace one, there, there is no kind of namespace um, object within my, my DR API that I, that I can call in order to capture this group of objects, um, which makes it very difficult to back up, say, namespace one and put it in one location and, and namespace two and put it in another location. Okay, so uh, the third concept is application consistency. So we talked about container granularity, and we want to be able to apply that for an individual application, say a distributed Cassandra database. But we also want to up level and say, I want to, I want to back up or I want to do DR for all the distributed applications running in a single Kubernetes namespace. Okay. Well, in order to do that effectively, we also need to add in this third concept, which is application consistency, right? Going back to an earlier point. Sorry, I wasn't even touching my mouse in the, um, uh, the screen changed. Give me one second. Hopefully everybody can see, um, can see my screen. Sorry about that. Um, in order for these DR to be effective, we need to make sure that when we back up that Cassandra database or that group of Kafka brokers or that Elasticsearch database, that the distributed backup that we're taking is application consistent, meaning we're not gonna get data corruption because we're taking kind of serial snapshots of a distributed system. And I just, you know, to go back to our, um, our simplified example, that is to say, you know, if I'm gonna back up this Cassandra database, which again is three nodes, but it's one database, three nodes, right? It's a distributed system. I have, I have a three um, uh, node Cassandra ring. I can't just take a snapshot of, of node one snap, then a snapshot of node two snap, then a snapshot of node three snap, and be guaranteed that when I recover that database in my DR site, that I'm not gonna get data corruption. Um, Cassandra has a particular way in which it needs to be snapshotted in order to be um, application consistent, right? In, in, in essence, I need to quiesce the database, make sure that none of those nodes are gonna accept any new writes. I'm gonna snapshot everything, then I'm gonna unlock the tables, um, and then, you know, I'm going to continue writing get, and, you know, flush all of those writes that are still in memory down to disk and then and carry on. Um, there's a particular kind of sequence of events that needs to happen in order to take that um, application consistent snapshot. That's different for how I'm going to snapshot MySQL. Um, it has its own way of snapshotting and we need to perform it, but it's different from Cassandra because typically it's going to, all going to be running on a single server. Um, Basically, what you need to do is make sure that your DR solution understands this notion of application consistency and say, I'm going to you know, have a DR site on the East Coast for an application that's running on production on the West Coast. I need to make sure that each of those incremental backups is application consistent, not simply crash consistent for my distributed systems. Um, this last point is, is, is really important. And... Um, uh, you know, as, as they all are, but I, I would say this is probably one of the biggest differences between container granular uh, DR uh, or Kubernetes DR and traditional DR, which is to say our DR system needs to be capable of backing up data and application configuration. Just data is not enough. Just application configuration is not enough. Um, so if I, if I look at this, I say, okay, what, what, what composes a Kubernetes application? Right. Let's take a simple example of a, a kind of a, 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 an app that does run on a single server. Right. We can apply this later to the concept of distributed systems. Or for now, let's just keep it simple. Well, if it's a data service, it's going to have a volume. It's going to have some application configuration, and it's going to have a bunch of Kubernetes objects associated with it. 
Uh, Kubernetes objects could be secrets, service accounts, you know, PVCs, controllers. There, there are dozens of these objects, and if we add in something like you know OpenShift, there, you know, there are dozens more very kind of specific objects that define how an application runs on that particular Kubernetes platform. Um, and if I want to recover my application, I need to have all of that application state as well as my what I'll call state state, right? My data. Um, if our DR solution is based on something that is only going to take, you know, a crash consistent snapshot, and I'm going to put that data somewhere else, right? That's key. It's a, it, 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 it's self essential, but not uh, sufficient. Um, then I'm going to have to recreate all of my application configuration and all of my um, application configure uh, all of my Kubernetes configuration and my application configuration in the new environment in order to recover that solution, right? That's very time consuming. And if you've been around DR for a while, um, you, you've, you've been a part of projects where everything's in place in the new environment. We just can't get the app up and running, right? Our RTO target, you know, gets missed by, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, you know, a week or more. This has happened in production applications. So, you know, we, we, we have DR in place, but we just can't recover that application. Oftentimes it's because of application configuration problems. Um, so what we need to do is um, for disaster recovery, and I would include, in fact, the, the slide here that says, talks about this in terms of migration, because if you think about DR, it's taking an app that's running in one location and making it available in another location. We can think about that as, as a migration. It needs to uh, contain both the application configuration and the data as a single set of objects, right? That, that I can recover together I can move together, um, uh, I can back up together in order to ensure that even if I have a low RPO, meaning I don't have not suffered any data loss, I can actually still get that very fast recovery. Um, and the, the, the last point is that our DR solution needs to be optimized for a multi-cloud world. Um, basically, you know, I need to have options for, you know, local metro area data centers, as well as wide area network based DR. And often this is mapped to that, that chart that we showed at the earlier, which is what are your business requirements? What are your RPO and your RTO objectives? Um, so if I look, if I look at, you know, an application that is going to have, you know, a very low RPO requirement. I might have two data centers and what we call a campus network. So this is going to be very low latency between them. I need to make sure that, you know, all of my data that's written to one data center is synchronously replicated to another data center. All of my application configuration moves over as well, right? The Portworks is one particular implementation of this, but, you know, there are many ways to solve a problem. And, you know, for low RPO, low RTO applications, you need to be able to figure out how to have, you know, a, a DR setup that, that gives you that, um, uh, uh, that capability. You know, so if I lose an entire data center, I can fail over my application to uh, a second data center. Now that's really different from, say, you know, having, uh, you know, a DR site on the East Coast um, for a production application on the West Coast or from, from Europe to Asia or vice versa. Um, there, the latencies are going to be such that we're really not going to be able to use synchronous replication. We're going to have to do some type of incremental backup. Um, uh, but again, we want to make sure that all of the data and all of the application configuration are in place in order to do that. Um, so we got, um, see what that looks like there. Okay, so, um, so everything that I've shared up to this point is really, you know, it, whether or not Portworks exists, it, it doesn't change the need for container granularity, the need to be able to speak, you know, within the Kubernetes primitives like namespaces, the ability to take application consistent snapshots of di distributed systems, um, et cetera. All, all of that main, it, it is maintained. Um, I mentioned at the top of the show that Portworx is one particular implementation of this, and I don't, I don't want to take up a lot of time talking about it, but I, I do want to just, you know, hold up an example of a company who has successfully done this in production. Um, I think that's really important just to know that, you know, there are, your peers are doing this today. Um, they are being successful with it. And, you know, sometimes seeing those success stories gives us confidence that we can try it too within our organization. So I'll just mention really quickly uh, that this particular customer um, wanted to move a new app over to Kubernetes, um, had a kind of a traditional enterprise DR requirement around zero RPO failover, 
uh, between two completely distinct data centers. Um, and you know, if that app could solve that business requirement, I mentioned that at the beginning, that it would come over to Kubernetes. Um, and if it if it couldn't, then you know, unfortunately, the app wouldn't be able to move over. It was very binary within this financial service institution. Um, and you know, I'm really proud that we were able to help them address this uh, this DR concern, um, which again really speaks to the maturity of the Kubernetes ecosystem. There was took a lot of you know into projects and people and processes working together in order to make this happen. But you know, if I were to say you know point to one thing that gives me confidence that Kubernetes is going to be around for the next ten years, I mean it's the ability to run quote unquote traditional enterprise applications with these hard requirements around DR successfully on Kubernetes, um, that, that gives me um, confidence that really there, there is no, there's no limit to the types of applications that, that can run successfully on the Kubernetes platform. Um, the last slide before we move over to, um, uh, to Q&A um, would be to say, you know, if you're interested in, in kind of exploring how Portworx can help your organization um, with, um, you know, with DR or, or you know, other solutions, you know, we're a really happy and proud member of the CNCF um, uh, Foundation. Um, you know, we go to all the KubeCon events, so you can always find us there. Um, and our platform, Portworx, runs on any Kubernetes platform. So, you know, if you're, you know, if you're an OpenShift or you're running one of the cloud providers or Ranch or IBM, you know, we work with all of those. Um, you know, you can continue to use whatever hardware you have, whether that's the cloud or you have particular storage hardware, you know, you bought pure, pure storage and you really love it, but you want to apply that container granularity, um, you know, we can we leverage your existing solutions um, and then provide solutions not just for DR, but also for migration, for backup, uh, security, awesome. um, et cetera. Um, so with that, I would like to turn it over for questions. Um, and so I think Siraj is going to walk us through that part of it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Michael, for a great presentation. Uh, we now have some time for questions. Uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask, please drop in, in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as we have time for. So we got two questions as of now. At what level would service mesh like Istio fit into the DR failover setup for data center if applicable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the, the networking component is um, oftentimes is one of the, the key elements of an effective DR system. Because what you want to do is you want to do a couple of things. One is make sure that the DR site is staged properly with your data and your application configuration, right? It, that, that's the starting point. Um, we want to stage it based on our RPO and our RTO objectives. So if, if we have a zero RPO objective, well, you know, every write to data center one needs to be replicated to data center two, right? That's what we talked about. Um, then we want to detect a data center failure, right? Um, we want to detect that it's not just a momentary network partition, but, but something that is truly a failure. And there we're going to be able to use our monitoring stacks right? Um, Prometheus, for instance, you know, we're going to look at things in Grafana. We're going to, we're going to use our, our metrics and monitoring to determine what is truly a disaster. Then we need to make sure that our application traffic is routed to the appropriate site. So if that is, um, you know, in the, um, in the zero RPO uh, example, we want to make sure that we're going to push everybody to data center too. And that's really where Istio comes in. Um, exactly how you determine what is a failure communicate that to your service mesh such that your traffic starts to be routed to uh, the second environment um, is different based on, you know, are you, are you working in VPCs? Kind of what is your, you know, what's your load balancing strategy like? Um, so it, it's hard to talk about in the abstract, but I would say kind of the three things you need to do in order to implement DR within your organization is make sure that your apps are staged in the DR site, determine your strategy for, for, disambiguating between a momentary blip and something that you consider to be a true disaster, right? Your, your failover trigger. Um, and then look at how you want to um, redirect your applications um, once that trigger has been met um, in order to route your traffic to the, um, to the DR environment. And you know, if, you, if you have particular questions about your, your network, you know, feel free to reach out to me at michaelportworks.com or you know, uh, come over to the website and we can kind of help you, you know, look at the particulars. 
thank you uh, next question is is rbc solution runs for azure um i i don't feel comfortable kind of talking about their particular implementation um so i, I won't be able to answer that question unfortunately i will say that that as a company portworks has um, customers that are running in all of the major um, cloud Kubernetes services um, and doing DR in those services. So the Azure Kubernetes service, Amazon Kubernetes service, uh, GKE. Um, so if the question is more, does it work in a particular cloud environment? I can say, yes, that is, uh, that is absolutely the case. Um, you know, Rancher, OpenShift, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So next question is, uh, I'm new to Kubernetes. If we run AWS managed Kubernetes with DR and AWS Cloud has their own DR solution on their region location. So the two DR solution will get conflict or not? Um, yeah, it's, it, it, I would say no. Um, well, let me, let me, it's, it's, it's a, without the particulars, it's hard to know exactly how to answer the question. So let me, let me give a little bit of a higher level answer. Um, what I would just described in terms of kind of effect, five effective traits for disaster recovery for Kubernetes provides DR for applications running on Kubernetes. Um, and one of the main points I wanted to make there is that there's a difference between effective DR for a VM and effective DR for an application running on the VM. Um, the traits of effective DR that I described are at an application level. Um, and you may want to continue to have a DR in place at an infrastructure level. Um, and the two are not necessarily in conflict. It's just they're, they're taking, um, uh, providing redundancy at different levels of the stack, right? If I'm a DevOps team and I um, am responsible, so I build an application and I'm responsible for running it, right? That's a very common, you know, two pizza team type type organizing principle within even even kind of enterprise IT, um, and certainly within kind of what I would call like SaaS startups and things like that. So, so I build the app and I'm responsible for running the app. Now, if I'm going to get paged at three o'clock in the morning because you know I have a data center outage and I need to bring my application back up, it's much more efficient for me to be able to recover just my application and not have to think about what infrastructure was my application also running on at the time and let me you know recover that which would also include if i have active sessions um, in in one infrastructure and then i fail over to another infrastructure those sessions are going to get caught off it increases a lot of complex adds a lot of complexity uh, for if, I, if i'm only trying to recover my particular application so this is where we see teams disambiguating so for instance a really good example uh, by way of analogy would be to say you know if i'm running kubernetes on amazon i'm it doesn't replace other amazon technologies that that manage for instance my you know vms i still have my amis i still might use cloud formation for actually bootstrapping um individual vms but now i have software on top of those vms that provides additional capabilities and I'm going to use those capabilities where appropriate for certain tasks. And I'm going to continue to use my infrastructure prop, um, capabilities for other tasks. So there is some overlap from a DR perspective. I have a DR solution at an infrastructure level and I have a DR solution at a Kubernetes level. But at the end of the day, they both serve their own purposes. Um, and, um, um, and I think it's, it's increasingly common to have a solution at both sets of the stack. Uh, because there are different users at both sets of the stack. Yeah, thank you. Next question is uh, about, can you brief about Rook storage? Uh, I don't fully understand the question. Uh, I mean, I'm familiar with, uh, with Rook storage, but I don't know, like specifically around DR or um, just in general. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, whoever posted the question can elaborate on your question. Meanwhile, uh, we can take the next question, which is if GitOps model is in place, we may not need to backup Kubernetes config. 
how does tool like Portworks differ? Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. And I don't know that in practice, I fully agree, I fully agree with that or I, and I don't, I don't want it to turn into a kind of a philosophical debate. Um, you know, all of our customers practice, you know, uh, version control and, and GitOps. It's just, you know, it, it's very rare that you have a team that's moving to Kubernetes and is not doing, you know, some version of version control and, you know, deploying uh, via modern deployment practices that are increasingly called uh, GitOps. Um, and so the application configuration um, is, you know, sometimes there are runtime changes that happen um, and, you know, or you have a particular, ver you have a version control, but you have 15 different versions um, of a particular um, application configuration or container. Um, and always understanding what version of the, of the application was running uh, with what particular data volume is a complex problem in and of itself. And so for very low RPO and very low RTO applications, uh, basically where you can suffer zero data loss and your, your recovery time, say, is less than one minute. Um, it's a more effective solution to copy over the, uh, the application configuration versus rebuilding it or repulling it from scratch from your version control system. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's always the case. Like I, I talked about, um, you know, if I have a 24-hour a RTO, where you know, I've got some time before I, my application needs to be back up and running, maybe a GitOps version control based application configuration uh, would, be, um, would be appropriate. But if I'm talking about a sub two minute um, uh, RTO, uh, where my application needs to be up and running like that, chances are you're not gonna have enough time to rebuild from source. So I think it's a matter of understanding your business requirements, understanding how the different technologies work together um, and, you know, pick the right solution for you. Again, I'm not here to, you know, pitch any particular solution so much as to lay out some of the, um, some of the mechanics. Uh, cool. So this one more question about, can you elaborate on hyperconverged storage for DR using Rook plus CFFS? Hyper, yes. Um, So the, um, I'm not an expert on that. So I, I want to be careful that I don't position kind of, I don't want to talk in categorical statements. So I would, I would, you know, reframe the question, or I would say if I wanted, if I wanted to answer that question, if I wanted to become an expert on this topic, um, I would do things like look at whether or not Rook and Seth can, can, um, you know, meet the requirements for, for Kubernetes DR that the model that I outlined earlier. So for instance, um, can I, you know, can I target a namespace with that product? So if I have a hundred pods and a hundred volumes running on a Kubernetes cluster, um, can I manipulate them at a namespace level? I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, that's the way I would approach it. Um, and, I, and um, you know, can I, you know, um, run in, in different, you know, network topology modes, you know, both kind of, you know, a, a stretch cluster across two data centers, as well as distinct clusters. Um, you know, can I take um, application granular snapshots versus machine granular snapshots? Um, I think that's the way to, to answer that question. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to be, to be able to answer it for you, but I think it gives you a model for being able to, you know, ask, you know, uh, the right questions in order to get an answer to your question. Yeah. So we got one more question, which is how is Portwork different than Valero, which is Heptio R? It's okay. I'm on, uh, he, he's speaking. I'm not I'm speaking. I just have to listen. Yeah, you are, you are speaking actually. <laughs> um, uh, someone on mute. Um, so um, yeah, that's a good question. I would say at a high level, um, so Portworks is a, what I'll call a quote unquote integrated solution. Um, meaning it, it's, it's a tool that handles the application configuration, the Kubernetes objects, as well as the volumes. 
um, as kind of a single class of objects. And we, we have a technology that we call Kube Motion, um, which is basically this ability to capture application state and data as a single set of objects. And one way you can use that is in DR. Another way that you can use it is in, um, uh, is in backup. Um, another way that you can use it is in migration. So Valero, I would, I would suggest is not a DR solution, uh, but rather a backup solution. The, the, the difference there is, um, and I, forgive me if I get any of the details wrong, my understanding is that if you had a zero RPO um, uh, failover requirement, uh, meaning zero data loss between two distinct data centers, that Valero itself would not handle the synchronous replication of data between environments. And I don't know if the way that its plugin model works, you could make sure that that was happening at a storage layer and that, that Valero was integrated into what's going on at that base storage layer, distinct from its backup solution. I'm just, I'm just not sure. Um, in order to be able to provide DR. From a backup perspective, um, uh, the difference would be that, you know, Portworx has a, you know, it's again that integrated solution. So you would, you know, log into uh, Portworx and you would, you know, point and click to the objects and the applications and the namespaces and the clusters that you want to back up. You would pick your, your backup locations. You would push all of that data there. Portworx would, you know, guarantee that, it, you know, it's there. If, if the data transfer fails, it would re retry, like kind of all of that, just nuts and bolts stuff. Um, and then if you wanted to recover one of those applications, again, you know, point and click, pick where you want to recover it to. So um, I think Valero is a important component of building a backup solution, but it's not a integrated in, in backup solution itself. Uh, whereas, you know, Portworx as a kind of a solution that, you know, people drop in and it solves kind of, you know, from nuts to bolts uh, without requiring a whole lot of integration points. Um, is that indent solution. So I, I, ho I hope that helps and I didn't get any of the details wrong. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so we have last question uh, for the day. Instead of having a standby DR site, what is the strategy to back up the production Kubernetes infrastructure for an effective recovery? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, a, a DR site uh, assumes that you're, you know, for, for that zero RPO use case, it assumes that you're running compute already in that other environment. And, you know, and as soon as you turn on compute, you start paying for it, whether or not you're buying the servers, you're running it in the cloud. Um, so I would, I would look at kind of a backup model. If you, if you're really trying to save costs, uh, but you still want to be able to recover applications and you're okay with, you know, a lower RPO um, because backups are not going to give you that synchronous replication. It's, it's going to be based on snapshots and there are going to be, you know, some, some limits and the snapshot granularity with different solutions. I would look at that. Um, and I would just suggest that again, you look at making sure that you're backing up the config, the app config and the Kubernetes objects, as well as the data. Um, and that could be using something like Valero, it could be using something like Portworx, you know, Cast and other, other solutions uh, for, for that. Um, because the recovery part is, is almost all instances, the really, really hard part of backup and recovery. Um, making sure that the app can run consistently without data corruption in the new environment quickly. Um, and the best way that I've found to ensure that that is one, make sure it's containerized, right? Kubernetes takes care of that for us um, because we kind of smooth out some of those environmental differences and then make sure that you're backing up the data, the app config and the Kubernetes object as a single group, um, pull them all down together. You don't have to kind of pre-stage your compute in order to do that, um, but you still get you know, moderate, moderate um, RTOs um, in that case. Okay, so this one more question. I think we have one minute to answer that. Will Portworx take a backup of HCD? Um, so, so Portworx is a persistent storage and data management solution for Kubernetes. So etcd is, is just a database, right? I'm saying just in air quotes. It's very important one for Kubernetes. Um, Portworx can, you know, uh, take a backup of any stateful service, Cassandra, Kafka, um, etc. Um, so the answer to that can be Portworx can be used as your persistence layer for etcd. Um, but there, there's a kind of a, 
an integration problem is that if you're using your, your etcd is underlying your kubernetes service and portworks is providing persistent storage for your kubernetes service based on that etcd it's kind of like you know it's a snake eating itself so in that case what what we do is we back up the objects in etcd which is different from backing up etcd itself basically when we see the kubernetes configurations within etcd we will rewrite them and put them um, in a in the backup location so that even if your etcd goes away that all of the data is still preserved um, it's a little bit of a a, um, a a subtle distinction kind of backing up etcd versus backing up the objects that are in etcd uh, but for this kind of world in which you have multiple layers of abstraction that are built upon each other that's the most effective way that we've seen it work for our customers. Okay, great. So thanks, Michael, for a great presentation. All right. And that is all the question we have time for today. So uh, thanks for joining us today. The webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNC webinar. Have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice day.